Tommy, no, you got it all wrong. He's... Oh, oh, Anthony. He's a big boy. He knows what he said. What'd you say? Right. Funny how. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a sit down with Michael Francis. And today is Mob Movie Monday. And back by popular demand, we have the movie Goodfellas, part two. comments after we did part one it just had to be another one part two and everybody was telling me Michael you didn't do it long enough we can do a whole hour and a half and well if we're gonna do an hour and a half I suggest you go watch the entire movie it's probably better than listening to me but um, we're gonna get into it a little bit more last time we did uh, part one I really focused on some of the characters in the movie and um, you know the main characters and today we're gonna go through some of the scenes but before I do that, I have to answer a question because everybody's driving me crazy. Michael, when is there going to be a movie on your life? You got to get Scorsese. You got to get Pelleggi. I explained this once or twice, but we have a lot of new subscribers just tuning in for the first time. Right now, there is a movie based upon my life that is not a movie. I'm sorry, a television series based upon my life with a major production company, big time writer. It's in active development. I can't mention the name. I'm not at liberty to do that at this point in time, but I'm pretty sure by next year, it'll be going into production. You'll be hearing all about it at the right time. They'll make an announcement and then you'll know everything about it. I'm very excited about it. I think they're doing a great job in the development process. I'm working with them. Uh, so uh, just look forward to that. So hopefully I've answered that for everybody. But uh, let's get to Goodfellas part two. So we're going to go through a couple of scenes and I'm going to tell you if they're authentic or not. I'll relate maybe some of my own personal experience. We'll take it from there. You know, one thing I do have to say, you remember when Sonny, the restaurant owner, came over to Pesci and asked him to pay the bill because, you know, he hadn't been paying his bill. It was all on credit. I've seen that happen. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I was a little bit of a high roller. I was out six nights a week in a club. One of them I used to frequent all the time was a place called Channel 80. It was on Long Island. Paul Ivario happened to have a piece of that. I think it talked about it in another place. I would go there at least twice a week in that place, sometimes three times. I loved it. I wish I had the money back that I spent because I'd bring my whole crew up there. Normally, I was paying the tab. I wish I had the money back that I spent. So, yeah, when you're spending money, they love for you to come around. But uh, anyway, that was a funny scene. Um, it is quite accurate. Some guys, are, you know, they expected, hey, I'm a made guy. I don't have to pay the tab. People didn't like that. You know, you don't get a good reputation when you do something like that. So Tommy DeSimone, I don't know if that scene is exactly accurate. If he did have a tab there, I don't know. He seems like the kind of guy that could have been that way. You know, he was kind of a loose cannon, thought who the heck he was in some ways. He wasn't a made guy, uh, but he seems like the kind of guy that can do that. So that could have, that was a pretty accurate scene. The scene that followed when Sonny now got scared because, you know, uh, Pesci hit him with the bottle, he goes and see Paul Ivario and he tells him about it and he's upset about it. And uh, he's afraid because he knows Tommy's a loose cannon. So he goes to Paulie, the boss that, uh, you know, uh, of that crew. Paulie, help me out. Well, how is he going to help him out? You know, take a piece of my club. If you've got a piece of the club, everybody's got to pay the tab and nobody's going to bother me. I know that. So Paulie reluctantly in the movie says, OK, I'll take a piece. Trust me, in real life, he would have taken the piece right away. He probably had a piece already, you know, and, and that wouldn't have happened anyway. But he would have taken a piece right away. And then they showed um, they were busting the place out, you know, that they were charging everything on credit, bringing in liquor for uh, a price and then selling it and, and busting the place out. Possibly, you know, Paulie might, might have been the kind of guy to do that. If that were me or a lot of guys that I know in that position, we would have wanted to see the place make money. I mean, I was involved in a lot of places. A place called Jupiter's on Long Island. I had another place way out on Long Island. It was called the Butterfly. I forget the, uh, uh, the French name, but Butterfly in English, whatever it was. I had a piece of a couple of places, and I wanted to see them work. I wasn't looking to bust them out. So there was both ways that you can do that, depending upon who the owner was, how much respect you had for them how big the club was. But yeah, we got involved in a lot of those situations. I enjoyed it because I was, you know, I used to go out six nights a week. So like a lot of other guys. 
So, um, you know, absolutely, Paulie could have taken a piece, whether he busted it out or not. I don't know. I don't know the particulars of that, but uh, pretty realistic scene. The next scene, Copacabana. We see Henry going through the kitchen and getting into the club. Why would he have to do that? Because there was always a line, you know, uh, out front for the Copacabana because that was the club. Everybody played that club from Sinatra to Dean Martin to Jimmy Roselli. I even saw Tiny Tim there, Bobby Darren, you name it. That was a, a, a favorite place of my dad's. Uh, he would get, you know, ringside table every time he went in. Julie Padell, who was the owner of the Copacabana, loved my father. My father always went in there with a big crew, uh, you know, spent a lot of money. I always had a ringside table. It was a great atmosphere because in the Copa, uh, you sat about 300 people. That was it, maybe 350. The tables were very narrow because they tried to squeeze as many people as, as they could in there. And uh, if you were eating dinner in there, you were practically on top of each other. But for me, it was great. We always sat ringside. I was always right up front to see all the main headliners at that point in time. You can never see that today. Today, they play 50,000 seat arenas. But back then, it was so good. No matter where you were, you had a great seat in the house. But it was re really terrific. I'll tell you one thing I pulled on my dad once. Uh, you know, it was, uh, I believe it was my, I, I can't remember, it was my, my senior prom or my graduation. But, you know, everybody wants to go out. You're graduating high school. It was high school. It was 1969. And so I said, Dad, you know, uh, what could you do for us? You know, we know that the Fifth Dimension is playing at the Waldorf and uh, Dion Warwick was playing at the Copa. So my dad, you know, could have got into both places and done, uh, done us well. So he said, well, let's do it at the Copa. But he said, Michael, 40 people? This is Dion Warwick. It's sold out. I said, Dad, come on, all my friends in school with their girls. My dad gets us in there, 40 kids that night, ringside table for Dion Warwick. It was like the biggest thing in the world. Everybody loved it. We had a blast. After that, we go into the lounge. You know, the other side, they had a lounge there. And uh, my friends were all impressed. I mean, that night, Joe Colombo was there. Everybody was there. And guys were handing me $100 bills, $200 bills you know, uh, congratulating me for graduating high school. My father was announcing at that time I was going on to college. You know, I was going to be a doctor. That was before, you know, everything blew up. Uh, but the Copacabana was a great place. And I got such great childhood memories of that place. Uh, but I'll tell you this, Henry Hill did not walk through that kitchen unless he was with Paul Ivario or somebody of real substance. Henry, again, a poor soul. I don't like to say anything negative stuff about him. It was a great movie and it, you know, it, it served its purpose, but he just wasn't the guy that was portrayed, that he was portrayed to be in that movie. He never looked so good as he did in that movie. Anyway, so that's it, let's move on. When Henry got married, you know, that scene, it just reminded me, weddings and funerals. When you're a made guy, People I always tell you, there was times that I had to go to three weddings in a weekend and maybe two funerals. You're a made guy, you know, you, you get a call from the boss or your capo or whatever. Hey, somebody's getting married, you gotta come. And when I was a capo, I would, uh, I would call up and I would say, well, how many guys do you need there? I'll bring three or four guys and make sure they got their envelopes. And we would sit at a table, it was all the guys. Half the time, we didn't know who was getting married. And if somebody died, we didn't know who died. But we had to be respectful to the maid guy, whosoever it was, you know, whose daughter or son was getting married. And, you know, God forbid, a family member was, uh, was uh, passed away. So weddings and funerals, you know, so often throughout the month uh, on weekends, that's where I had to spend my time. It was just a thing. Another scene, and I've been asked about this all the time, is the... Um, the scene in the prison when all the guys were together and they were eating. I'm going to tell you this. That's a highly exaggerated scene. I've said this once before and people came back to me and said, no, Michael, it was accurate. And I asked them, well, were you there? How do you know it was accurate? That was, that was a highly exaggerated scene. I will tell you this. In federal prison, that would never happen. You don't ever have that kind of a setup in federal prison. Did we eat better? I know I spent eight years, my dad spent 40, so I know exactly what was going on there. Did we eat better at times? Yes, because we had Italian guys in the kitchen. Sometimes we had the Mexican guys in the kitchen. We got close with them. We were able to smuggle a little food in. You get a hold of the guard and say, look, you know, we got some great cooks here. You can have a steak, you could eat along with us, but you know, let us eat a little better. And so we ate a little better. And sometimes they'd smuggle some things out of the kitchen where we can be in our cells and eat a little better. So in federal prison, yes. State prison, it was a little bit more loose. Maybe you would have got guards to bring something in. Never to the extent that you saw 
in that prison scene. I never heard of it from anyone. I know countless guys that were in and out of prison, never heard anything like that. It was highly exaggerated, but yes, Italians, because it's important to us, we make sure we get, you know, as best service as we possibly can. So that's it for today. Um, we're gonna see you again tomorrow. We got another, another thing coming up special. Uh, we got some interviews coming up pretty soon, working on it. You know, things are loosening up here a little bit in California where we may be able to have some face-to-face -face interviews. I told you, I don't like to do Zoom. I'm a one-on-one -on -one guy. I want to get in a room with somebody. i uh, talk to you about that. So that's happening soon. MichaelFrancis.com, it's growing. The community is growing. My crew is getting bigger. People are loving it. It's really great. Subscribe on this channel. A lot of good stuff coming up. I'm telling you, subscribe. You're going to get alerts. All terrific. Thank you very much. I think we just passed 160,000 subscribers in you know, a little less than two and a half months. And uh, I thank you very much. You've been supporting this and uh, hopefully we'll keep providing content that entertains you, giving you a little information. And let me leave it with this because I always leave the moral of the story. Yes, I'm reviewing the movie. I want you all to understand what happened. Jimmy Burke died in prison. Henry Hill did all of that time. Uh, you wouldn't want his life after he got out in prison. Still had a tremendous drug problem, uh, alcohol problem. Henry had a tough life. Passed away a couple of years back. I think it was 2000, 2012. Uh, Paul Ivario, he passed away, did a lot of time in prison. The moral of the story is that life doesn't work, people, especially now. Too many informants on the street. Uh, the government is too sophisticated. They got too many weapons. You go that route, you're going down. That's it. So, you know, for all you young people that are listening, you know, many of you have heard me speak to you one on one. I visit prisons all the time. I have a ministry where I go help young adults all the time. It's part of, you know, my commitment, my way to give back. So please do the right thing. Stay on the right track. Uh, for those of you that, you know, like myself, are people of faith, be accountable to God, be accountable to the people around you. Worry about your family, because when you're doing the wrong thing, who gets affected by it? Your family, of course. Don't let it happen. So that's it for today. Uh, see you next time. I think tomorrow we'll be right back with something special. Uh, be safe, be healthy. God bless. See you next time.